Uh, sorry to see him go. He's worked with the best. Have uh, you boys scored coming on as a substitute this season? Not this season, no. No? No. no. And you boys scored at all this season? <laughs> No. no. Oh, well, that's fair enough. He has been the best. What are you talking about? Can you get me Alan Hansen's autograph? <laughs> um, that's so. Brilliant. And now, Alan Hansen, my friend Alan Hansen, is calling it a day. What was the uh, young Alan Hansen like? I was born in this mining village called Sockey that um, there was two choices. You either played football or played football. There was nothing else. John's the eldest, I'm the middle, and Alan was the baby. He's always been my wee brother and uh, always looked out for him. He was a very easygoing child. I think the way often third ch children are, um, everyone was fond of him. He winds me up constantly, but I know that there is this deep affection between both of us and my sister as well. When I got to secondary school at age 11, um, Jim Cousins, who was a history teacher, who had also been a professional footballer. Um, his encouragement was total. Come on. He was the one that was taking me to the, the Scotland School Board trials and, and just telling me basically that I was a great player and I, I would have a tremendous future in the game and I never ever believed him really. Listen, I used to watch him playing and I was amazed at how proficient he was at the game. He was outstanding. He was absolutely tremendous in controlling a ball. It never bounced away from him. He always had it under perfect control and he either went on a mazy dribble or he, he would put lovely passes on to other players. But he loved golf. Sometimes in the morning I think he went out and had a game before he even went to the football in the morning. We played three rounds every day and we were relatively young and he was always following me at the golf and I was because I would be playing with big boys. And then he, he chased me and he wanted to play with me and I threw him into, the, into a bunker and a man came over and started shouting at me. And I said, it's okay, he's my wee brother. As though that made it okay to throw him in the bunker. Golf's always been my first love. I stopped playing football at 15 and 17 to concentrate on golf, right? Yeah. My brother was playing football at the time and he, he thought it was crazy. He just wanted to play golf. That's all he wanted to do. Played football is a big thing, but he was a golfer. Much to the dismay of my father, who always wanted me to be a footballer. Just to placate him, I went in trial at Hibs when I was 17. And it was a week before I was playing the Scottish boys stroke play at Montrose. And Eddie Turnbull, after five days, brought me into his office as a manager, brings me in the office and says, right, we want to sign you on professional forms. And I said, well, I'm just packing and playing. I said, I'm going to Montrose to play in the Scottish boys stroke play. I said, I'm never playing football again. And he says, what, you're an idiot. And I said, no, no, I said, I'm a golfer. I said, I, said, I came here just to, to placate my father. He said, well, you've got a real chance here. And I said, well, I don't care. I said, I'm going to play golf. And off I went. I was surprised when he switched from golf to football because he desperately wanted to be a golfer. Mm. I'm pretty sure the time that changed it for him, we played Celtic in the League Cup final. Party Thistle, very much the outsiders. Celtic in the hoop shirts, commentator Archie McPherson. Up comes Hansen for this. We were underdogs, Celtic were. We had won the league title ten years in a row. And it's now the They'd won the European Cup 67. We had just been promoted from the league below us. And it's almost there. It's a goal. It's number three for this all. It's unbelievable. But we won 4-1. It's a ball. There's ball in there. It's a goal. The final score for Party Crystal 4-1. The first time they've ever won the Scottish uh, League Cup. And believe it or not, there were people who gave them no chance at all. When we came off the park at the end, I looked up to the stand and I saw Alan sitting in the front row and I've never ever seen him so animated and, and I think that was the time you realised I think I'm going to want to be a footballer here. Seeing the adulation, I think, for the players and the success and, and how it was possible for dreams to come true, I can imagine that that would have had a huge impact on him. I was meant to be going to Aberdeen University to study history, I was a historian. Somebody then said, you better become a PE teacher because I played four uh, different sports. Never got into the PE college. What am I going to do? Partick came and said, right, we'll, we'll give you this to sign on. Mm. We'll give you this a week. And I took it. And the rest is history. Football, in many ways, is just the last resort. Well, it was. It was great for us being at Socky because they kept their feet in the ground. And it was great going to Partick because it was just a fantastic team. The Hanson brothers together at Partick, the Jags. Nobody at Firhill got above himself either. I had four great years at Partick, you know. 
If you think a crown in England is cynical, you'd in Scotland multiply it by 100,000. And in at Partick, they'd be shouting, Hanson, you're a waste of time. Hanson, you're this, Hanson. And I was one of the favourites. They were right. <laughs> they, they were right as well. They were spot on. It was very difficult playing with him because he was really skillful and I was a really fast runner. He always assumed that you could do what he could do and obviously we couldn't. Was the young Alan Hansen um, cocky? Know it all? Mm, I was very, very shy and introvert. Really? Well, I really was. I mean, I went to Liverpool at, at 21, totally inadequate. You know, I felt right at my death. And I, I was so nervous going there. I just, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to leave Scotland. I think it probably surprised people when you say I was a nervous individual. Are you still nervous to this well, day? I, think? I mean, I've seen your... Yeah, more know, nervous than ever. I'm more, I'm more nervous yeah. than ever. People think he's super confident, but he's actually really shy and and insecure and and he's even after all these years and match of the day he's still really nervous. The more experience I got at, at Liverpool I'm thinking the nerves will disappear but they never, they got worse. The nervous 21 year old was signed by Liverpool in 1977. Anfield, the cop tests if anyone's nerves. I used to sit in the Liverpool dressing room and 77, they thought I was the coolest character ever because I'd sit there with a program, never warmed up, sit there with a program singing the Billy Joel song, Don't Go Changing. Don't go changing. And like, they, they look at me and go, that's unreal for a kid. I mean, it's something, but underneath it, I am like churning. What, what, but, what was the feeling? Well, the feeling was just what, you sickness. Of, sickness, of I was just sickness. Yeah, just scared. Ten minutes to go, the, the bell goes to go out onto the pitch. So I'd been stretching off and doing whatever. I said, Alan, are you not going to get warmed up? Oh, he says, yeah. Just stands up and gives it one of them and goes back in. All right, let's go. <laughs> and he walks out onto the pitch. But as soon as I got touched the sign, got down the tunnel, not a nerve in my body. How did you play in your first game? I played very well. Mm. It, was, it was the second game where they played so well. And then we had a bad run. I think we had three defeats in the trot, and Bob Paisley went to the papers and said, the only person playing well in the Liverpool back four is Alan Hansen. On the Saturday, he reads the team sheet early. <laughs> I'm the only one that's not playing. I then go and, and see him on the Monday and say, how can you say in the papers that I'm the only one playing well? And you leave me at the start and he says, listen, son, the longer you play this game, you'll realise that experience is everything. Mm. And he was spot on. But for the first year, I was tremendously homesick. Sunes. And there's Doug Lee's through. Is that going in? Yes, it is. I went home to someone and after winning the European Cup, didn't want to come back to Liverpool. We were worried he wasn't going to settle in. You know, there was lots of stories in papers about players going to big clubs and getting led astray. And, but the best thing, you know, I've said it often, the best thing that ever happened to him was he met Jan. And Jan, you know, he's besotted we are. Even now he's still besotted we are. They couldn't have met at a better time. But what about those nerves? Would he fluff his opening lines? We met in a club in Liverpool. I didn't follow football, so I didn't know um, what he did. And actually, when we did start chatting, uh, he said he worked in insurance. Do you think you settled in better in, to Liverpool when you met Janet? Oh, Sunday? she was, I mean, never, my whole family says she saved me. Um, I wouldn't go that far. He is bone idle. He is bone idle. He will play golf, he will go on holiday, he will try to do as little as possible. The only thing that's going to prevent him doing that is Jan. She's sweet and she's lovely and he's horrible and he's miserable. So you, you just don't really put them together. We got married in 1980, um, in the June. And then we had Adam a year later, next June, and Lucy three years after that. They make a very good couple. Uh, I think, I think Mum's probably the only person who um, Dad would ever concede he's wrong to. He's t totally himself when he's at home. Uh, on the TV, he's quite a serious, hard man, whereas he's the total opposite at home. He has a very soft side, which I think he would be at pains to hide from people. And when the chips are down, you can count on Alan, you know, for support, for love. You'll never ever see him at fancy parties, showbiz parties. You'll never ever see him on Strictly Come Dancing or anything like that. He just wants to be home with his wife and kids. We go everywhere as a family. Um... The kids have been great. They're not I mean, kids anymore. No, they're not. They're 32 and 29. The potential for them to grow up, to be brats in that environment was immense, but you couldn't meet two nicer kids, and that's down to him and Jan. And, and that's, for me, that's his biggest achievement. Which is saying something. On the football field, Liverpool were flying. 
In seven seasons from 1978, they won the European Cup three times. The league five times. Four League Cups. There would be more when he was captain. But this was the age of pure joy. In, in your playing career, so much success. Highlight? So many, I suppose. European Cup final, mm. uh, 78. Um, double winning captain, 86. 86. 86, great year that. Um, 84 in Rome. Amazing in Rome. Mm. We're in the tunnel and we've got three guys that played for Middles, right? Graham Sinus, Dave Hodgson and Craig Johnson. And they start singing this Chris Rea song. I don't know what it is, but I love it. And so everybody started singing it. So the Roma players, <laughs> they, just, they just looked at us like we were like off our head. And we were. Bruce Grobola has a little chat with himself. Francesco Graziani against Bruce Grobola. Graziani. Over the top! It was such a great night. And Ellen Kennedy has won the European Cup for Liverpool. To go in there and, and win a penalty <laughs> shot was fantastic. Liverpool have won it for the fourth time and the cup is lifted and it glitters silver. Who's so, the best player you played with? Kenny? Oh, Kenny was the best Kenny player. Was a great and, then, player. Yeah, was, and then Graham was next. I mean, yeah. I go to Liverpool as a 21-year-old, first Scotsman there in that era, and then I get followed by a couple of lesser-known Scots going with Dalgoos and Sunez. Ross here for Rowcastle. Off the line, Alan Hansen. Hansen at the back. Sunez in midfield. Dalgoos up front. Absolutely outstanding finishing. They can still knock a ball around. Sort of. We're not in Florida, you know. Don't worry, it's only Andrew. Only the best players in the world can do that. He just said to me, it's 30 years ago since we played in Rome European Cup final. He actually remembers a ball he passed to me and I miscontrolled it. So you, is that... He did that quite a bit, to be fair. <laughs> he used to come and try and take the ball off me. And I say, well, what are you coming back here for? I'm a better passer than you are. <laughs> oh, he's shy. <laughs> Kenny and I live really close to each other, but Graham lives in pool somewhere. But Graham Sunis is, is a type of person. You don't see him for five years and you can pick up like that. At the start, when you came, I was the first Scot in that era. So I really didn't know what to expect. So, you know. How long did it take you to become a bully? You two were ten times worse than I ever was. Just because we tried to portray the jokes as a master race. <laughs> I mean, and that, and, and that, that wasn't very difficult because the average IQ in there was about minus six. <laughs> it was, it was, it, it wasn't difficult. To, to... Now higher up you go in football, the dressing room, the, the banter is more severe. Mm. You know, the humour is more severe. It's like you can't wait to get into work. <laughs> you just can't wait to get there because all the, you know, the banter and the, the Mickey taking. That's mm. why it was so successful and so good, wasn't it? Because in the dressing room, there was nobody arrogant. Was it, was no, it? it was. There was nobody any. We weren't the best professionals. Trained properly, but mm. enjoyed a night out and maybe drank too much alcohol. Speak didn't eat yourself. Right, didn't write all of us, didn't eat the right food. <laughs> and we were playing against teams like the Germans, like the Italians, who would still beat them easily. And the longer the game went, the more tired they got and the stronger we got. Maybe it comes into desire. Yeah, I think it's the combination of everything, isn't it? Man, people used to turn up to watch us train with a notepad. Aye. On the first day, right down. Walk to perimeter, jog to perimeter, five asides, sprints, five asides, sprints, finished. Second day they write it down, third day there was no writing, it was notepad was sitting next to them. These guys would say to me, do you come back in the afternoon? Uh, no. Do your tactical stuff? I said no. Did you come back in the afternoon? <laughs> well, I remember that I go to Kenny's for uh, Christmas Day. Right. Right. And Kenny says, Graham's coming. Right. So you come through and just the usual, what happens? The champagne comes out and this is like the day before the game and, and Kenny says, well, we'll just have one glass and of course, well, and we go on the bus, and I thought to myself, I said, oh, we had a bit too much here the day before the match, and blah, blah, blah. And we beat, we beat them 3 0. <laughs> we beat them 3 0. And we all played really well. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when we used to win things? You know, win a trophy, yeah. there was a jock picture. Why did you never ever join in? Yeah, because I was always on the outside, and when it, when it hit the, the papers, you it caught me up. Right, right. So I got in the middle, but the, the best one, you'll love this. The best one is in the bar at um, Cameron House. There's 50 great Scots in there. The good thing is you're not in it, but anyway, first time we were there, Janet comes back to me and she says, 50 great Scots, you're in the picture. So I was like, am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Right. right, so anyway, I go down there, I go into the bar, and like, I'm looking everywhere, and I'm thinking, well, like, there's pictures, and like, I'm not in it. Where where and then I eventually <laughs> see a picture of him, right? <laughs> European Cup final in Rome, and my right ear's in it. You can tell it's my ear, just my ear. You're in, you're in. Well, the ear. Fifty great Scots and the year, yeah, in that era. To have played with, you know, two of the great players was fantastic. But they were all great players. Every one of them that played in that team was 
was exceptional. It's strange how this one worked out. Two of that great team who played together and then both walked on into punditry. Still talking a great game. In comes Lawrence. Always a double click. You double click? No. no oh, that was brilliant. brilliant. Makes you feel invincible. You do that every single time. Yeah. And then down and out, and hear the noise. The shender and noise greeting you. Right, come on then. I've heard so much about this goal that never was. Well, you say it was. You've got to remember, Man United, the top of the table, they're a point in front of Liverpool. Liverpool have got a game in hand. It's nil nil, 21 minutes, 8 seconds in the match. And I play it to Sunas there. Graham gets it, and I keep going. No opposition. Well, they've, they've all, everybody's moving, so they've, the whole thing's opened up. Right. And I get to here, and I'm, and I'm still looking, and I just kept going. And Ray Kennedy's just edge of the box. Yeah. I played it into his feet. Ray Kennedy's played it back to about 22 yards out, and I'm oh, thinking. 22 exactly. 20, 22 yards, about 3 yeah. inches. And I've just put my foot back, hit through it, and pinged it into the bottom corner. Did you not like where Gary Bell no, was? No, 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 I just, 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 hit, I just hit it. I just hit it in the right hand side. A centre back that's played two one twos and run 65 yards and buried it in the corner, and not one camera in the ground. You, not one you camera. Just in the nobody, analysis on this nobody's one, yeah. ever seen that right, goal unless you're in it. But the big thing there is like, nobody ever believes me when I tell that story. I find it a bit difficult. Oh, honestly, it was one of the greatest goals ever scored here, allegedly. Is in here. Yes! 1986, Alan is now Liverpool captain and Merseyside rules. Liverpool and Everton going toe to toe in the league and in the cup and all the way the to win. Is this three? It is! 1986, Kenny was the manager. Mm. Um, Great memories for you, of course. Yeah, yeah obviously yeah. not. I, mm. I was at Everton at, at that particular stage and. Um, Three times we played you, I must say I did score in all three games. And what did you win that season? Uh, precisely nothing. nothing yeah, good. Um, it was also mine a miracle, wasn't it? Because you were completely outplayed for most of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I mean, I make a mistake in that game. No, no, I just outfoxed you. Lineker off through the centre again. This is promising. Lineker for Everton. Saved by Bobola. Lineker. 1 0 to Everton. And who else but Gary Lineker? For the first time in my life, I'm like that. If my head had been right that day, if you had been Usain Bolt, you wouldn't have scored. But everything's about the result, as you well know. It was a great day, just seeing the, the sea of blue and red together. It, it, was, was, it, it was, was fantastic going in Wembley way, and the Evertonians mixing with the Liverpoolians. It was a great example to the world, I thought, about how uh, a city could come together. Never before have they won the League and Cup double, and now the moment is here. What a consolation for Alan Hansen in the week he was left out of the Scotland World Cup party. Four in the area. Linda! For me, the 86 World Cup would work out OK. But for Alan, it was an immense disappointment. He was left out of the Scotland squad by a certain Alex Ferguson. It never entered my head that there was a possibility I was going to be left out. So we played on the Sunday in Kenny's testimonial, and Alec Ferguson was uh, the manager of the home Scots, and he never said a word to me, you see, and I thought, well, that's unusual, because Alec always comes and, you know, talks to everybody, and I thought, you know, there's some strange here, but, you know, still couldn't believe that there was any remote possibility I'd be left out, and then the dreaded phone call came on the Wednesday, but even then, when he told me, it never really sunk in, it was only when the reports started to come back from the training pitch at Santa Fe and then on to Mexico that, you know, I felt really dejected. People keep saying, why do I hate Manchester United so much? And I would say Alex Ferguson, because he didn't pick Alan for the World Cup. And it's just harboured with us all these years because he was at the peakiest form, peakiest career, and he took the two Aberdeen players because he'd been the manager at Aberdeen. I don't ever said too much, but he was gutted. You know, I just said, well, I've got to accept your decision. You've picked the team, you've picked the squad of players, and you're the manager. And I just said, well, I wish you all the best. Liverpool have won the double. If you had said to me, do you want to be a double winning captain or go to the World Cup, you'd probably take double winning captain. So I'm more made up for the lack of Scottish caps by what I achieved at Liverpool. So I haven't any regrets with that in the slightest. You had lots of great times, um, lots of success on the field. You also lived through two enormous disasters, uh, of course, famously. Mm. Heysel uh, in 85. 
I'm afraid the news is very bad from Brussels. Hooliganism has struck again, and I'm afraid the scenes are as bad as anything we've seen for a long, long time. An evening in late May 1985. 39 people were about to die in the old Heysel Stadium in Brussels. My father had gone to the three previous European Cup finals. Wembley was fine. Paris, if you're a mile away from the ground, you didn't have a ticket, they were hitting you on the head. Rome was the same. Heysel, every man and the dog was getting in there. My dad said, he went with his ticket, he said, no, you went in with the ticket. There was nobody at the turnstile. We go on the pitch at 10 to 6, I think it was, to go to the Liverpool fans. There's a kiddies game on the pitch, we had to go on the pitch to go to them because they're throwing missiles at us, Juventus supporters. So I picked one up and I, th I remember saying to Alan Kennedy, nobody brings that into the stadium. And he says, that is the stadium. It was crumbling about the them. Uh, we are in the dressing room, we're ready to go out. They come and say, well, there's a major problem. Um, and the game has been put back. And it was the pressure of movement down towards the running track which resulted in the wall giving way and people being pinned underneath it. Do you think it should have been played? Well, the reason they played the game was they thought there'd be more trouble if they didn't play the game. I go on the pitch and, and I don't know how many were dead at the time. You're only focusing on one thing, that's the game. I mean, it's still, like... Despite it's still, despite even it's still, that. Even that. I mean, you're only focusing on one thing, it's the game. You've focused on the game, you're playing the game, and, and then you come into the dressing room afterwards and it is horrific, yeah. horrific. And it's like so sad. And, but we come home the next day, and then when you're home, you're sort of removed from it. The Liverpool squad arrived home after the most disastrous European tie in history to more media attention than had they won the cup for keeps in front of peaceful crowds. Flags were flying at half-mast out of respect for the dead, and it seemed in shame as well. Could football ever go more tragically wrong than this? In very different circumstances, it could. Hillsborough was totally different because we were still right in the middle of it. Four years later, FA Cup semi-final day. Liverpool against Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough in Sheffield. A huge crowd. Everyone looking forward to the match. Everybody, bar one. I played one reserve game in nine months. Um, there was a virus at night, the night before. Kenny Poole's one of the clubs, you have to play. I said, I don't want to play. I said, you know. I said, I'm not, I ain't ready to play, I've only played one. He said, you're, you're playing, they're right. How would you argue with all this? Anyway, I go on the pitch. Again, you're focused on the game. You, you, you can't see the crowds. You can tell. Could you tell there was something no, happening no, at all? No, no. no. The first inclination I got was two guys come on the pitch and, and, and I go to them right away. I said, you'll get us in trouble here. And the, the guy looks at me and says, and he, you can tell with the sadness in, in his eyes that you know, he wasn't making up. He says, Al, oh, there's people dying in there. We got off the pitch. The game was stopped. The game was stopped, and then somebody comes in and says there's 18 dead, and there was like 32, and then the numbers went up, and like it's a sense of shock. And then you go upstairs and you see the girls, and like they're crying their eyes out, they're watching uh, coverage of, of the events unfolding. But you still never really knew the enormity of, of what had happened. It's been a black day for football. On a sunny afternoon at Hillsborough, Sheffield, no fewer than 93 football supporters died. On a day of such momentous tragedy, our sympathies go to the families of those concerned. It wasn't until the next day we went to Anfield and we see on the, uh, the cop flowers like you'll never believe and it just suddenly hits you that this is much, much bigger and much a bigger disaster than you ever thought. What was it like being part of the club at, at that time and, and, the, and the circumstances it was and the weeks that it was followed? I mean, yeah. The next day we go to the, the hospital and there is a mother who has a son that's on a life support machine and they're going to turn it off. She wants you to come and speak to the boy. <laughs> well, I get up there and like the, the little kids, Angel, Adam's eight at the time, and I look at the mother and the mother is like, she was really strong for the, for the, the son. And um, you say a few words, to the, I was in, they had me in the corner in bits, I mean, I'm crying my eyes out in the corner. Um, and then, then we get back and then Johnny says to me, well, what about the mother? You're crying your eyes out, but you're all right. You know what with the mother, and then you lose track of, like, you, you maybe think of yourself, and, you, and then you suddenly think, what with the families that, they, they, for the rest of their lives, um, the, the emptiness is going to be there. And, and then don't tell me that you can understand what they're feeling, because you haven't been. There's not a chance that you can understand how they're feeling, and they've been feeling it for 25 years. Um, and then you know, Kenny and Marina were, were phenomenal, and they set up the Sing the Players Lounge. We were going in there, 
and like you're coming out in tears every time. You went to a lot of the funerals. Well, well I went to about 12, okay. yeah. you know, and I said, I remember saying to Johnny after the first one, this won't get better, no, it, it got worse. Has it, has, it, has it always lived with you? It's this, when it's brought up, you all think about it and it's like, it is distressing. I mean, just the grief, I mean, the grief and the emptiness and just the sadness, I mean, the sadness, I mean, it's a football match, 96 people at a football match. You never know if you're doing the right thing, like talking about it in television. Are you doing the right thing? Did they want you to speak about it? Did they want you to play on? I mean, you can, I don't think you could ever get a consensus of, of what they wanted. You can't get a consensus of what's right and what's wrong. You just do what you think is for the best. Twenty-five years on, Hillsborough is still with us, still resolving the questions about what happened at a football match a quarter of a century ago. Eighteen months or so after that, Kenny Dalglish quit as mm. manager of Liverpool. Do you think Hillsborough was anything to do with it? Hillsborough took its toll yeah. on Kenny. Did he confide in you? Before well, he confided in me in virtually everything, football-wise. Mm. I mean, he told me in '85 in the February that he was he was becoming the new manager of Liverpool. But this time he didn't. He just came into the dressing room and said, "I'm leaving," and I went, "What?" I just felt that I'd gone far enough and, and I don't think that I could, I could delay any longer. Having played over 500 games for Liverpool and with a record eight championship medals, Alan Hansen is strongly tipped to now join the management team and take his place in the famous boot room and maybe in the top job. I come back to the training ground and I'm 64 on to get the job. So I then go to the chief executive, Peter Robinson, and I said, am I in the frame for this job? He said, oh, very much so. I said, well, I don't want it. He's a Liverpool legend and I think he thought if he did a bad job at management, he should lose all that. Am I right in saying that you might have kidded the Liverpool players on that you did get the job? What happened was Liverpool had been beaten at Luton on the Saturday and then been beaten again by Everton. So I went to Ronnie Moran, who was acting manager, and said, look, and I said, they've always taken the mic in the dressing room. Why don't I go in? And, and I gave him the biggest spiel of all time. He said, I've got some news. I'm taking over from Kenny. So I went, whoa, this is amazing. We never saw him as a, as a manager. He gets up, he said, there'll be a lot of changes. He said, Steve Nicholl, there'll be no more going to the pub, no more going to the Albert. He said, those days are over. He said, John Barnes. He said, you, he said, I know you're partial to a Kentucky Fried Chicken, there'll be no more of that. And he went around the whole team and they were looking at him thinking, what's he doing, I can't believe it. And then, and then the best bit is like, what we're going to do is we're going to video the game this Saturday, have a little bit of light lunch in the Sunday and go through. So <laughs> that by that time, like that. And then he walks out and all the players then start whispering, saying, oh, we liked Alan until he did this. I go down to the players' lounge and there's two Irish kids that have burst out the reserve team dressing room and this little kid gets on the phone to Dublin and he says, get as much money as you Bucky. possibly can <laughs> on Alan Hansen to be the next Liverpool manager. So I've got to put an end to it. I've got the phone done, went back to, and all I can hear is Hansen's at. <laughs> he came back in about a minute later. He said, not really, guys. I just want to say I'm retiring. But it was just typical Alan Hansen. He always had a joke. First person I see is John Barnes and he went like that. <laughs> So and I said, boys, I'm only kidding, I'm leaving. I thought Alan Hansen would have taken over after Kenny had left because Alan's knowledge of football is fantastic. The biggest year of the ceremony, holding up the league championship trophy. But I suppose the telltale sign is the fact that being such a nervous player and hating the pressure of having to play, imagine, because being a manager is ten times worse. Bill Shankly, Kenny Dalglish, Graham Souness, Scottish managers of Liverpool. So? Why did you never have a go at the management? Well, I wanted to keep my hair relatively black, but... You've never done that, have you? No, that's gone as well. I just never fancied it, you know. Yeah. Would you? I never, never By fancied the way, it. let me tell you, he wanted to keep his hair relatively black. I think supplemented it. Never at any stage. No well, tint whatsoever. And when you went into television, which is something I've done yeah. a good ten years after you, was that something you always fancied? No, never. I fell into it. I mean, absolutely fell into it. Now, you said before, when you were playing, you were nervous in the dressing room, which we never picked up on, did we? But I'm a warrior. But he was oh, yeah. I'm a warrior. He was flustered. When he used to bring it out for the yeah, back, yeah, yeah, he was yeah, flustered. And, 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 and nobody'd show for it. Or if he got into the opposing penalty ball, he was really <laughs> could flustered. He go, could he, oh, could he, could he, no. he had the equivalent could, of the yips and putting in golf. He couldn't get his right leg back. My right leg back to hit it. I'm telling you. Oh, he saw the gap too beautifully. So a lovely dummy. And Berkeley puts it in. Froze. I'm, I'm oh, froze. I'm, I'm froze. It was worse than that. Do you get a cold sweat on? No, no. Like what that? I used to do, I used to dummy myself. I used to go like that, and, and, and then and he'd be running, and he'd be. United coming out for the offside, and although uh, Hanson was doing the right thing, and indeed has been waved on by Pat Partridge, he will now score. It's not as if he'd be critical of you. If you no, 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 no. He just blamed me. Just, no, 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 no,
I think that's maybe where your inferiority complex and mine came yeah. from. Kenny, absolutely. Abusing us all the time. Over the years. By the way, let me tell you, I had plenty of ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> I'd realised at the time that as a player, if I was feeling the tension as much as I did, to become a manager is like you can multiply that by 100. I think Alan could have made a good manager. He, you know, his knowledge of the game, the way he puts himself over, is absolutely first class. Madison read that. He is one of the people that, you know, when I sit down at home and, and watch, you know, match of the day, he is one that I'll sit down and listen to. David Hodgson, yes. So you finished playing, you don't want to be a manager. How quickly did you decide to go into television? Well, Johnny said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, well, trust me, that phone will never stop ringing, which was the most naive thing I've ever said in my life because I'm qualified to do nothing. I mean, he played football um, and it's such a short career. Um, that, you know, suddenly it's over and what are you going to do? I mean, there's only so many managers' jobs and coaching jobs, um, but Alan didn't really know what he was going to do. So after three months, she said to me, remember that phone, it was never going to stop ringing, it's not on once. <laughs> so I had to get off my bike, sign. And I went to B Sky B, who were doing classic cup finals. The phone rang and it was a certain Alan Hansen saying, how do I get into television punditry? And he came and uh, did a few jobs for us and was brilliant. And obviously the rest is history. Alan did a little bit of radio work and then did some work for Sky and then obviously with the BBC. But um, it wasn't really a, a, um, a life plan of what he was going to do. I was in the radio, I was doing a bit in Sky and a bit in television. It was a great grounding for Match of the Day. Good evening. The Premiership season is underway again. Just another 37 weeks to go. 1992, a time to be daring. Who might lead the way in this new age of analysing and offering opinions? We'd just got a match of the day back after a four-year absence and everybody was very excited. Um, Desmond Liner was in his pomp at that time. Good evening, I suppose it's back to the future tonight. Match of the day returning on a regular basis after a gap of four seasons and 28 years after the very first programme. I don't remember it. Alan was a new boy, but they hit it off very quickly. We'll be doing our best to be sharp up front and tight at the back. They'd got the experience of Jimmy Hill, who had uh, done a lot of television jobs, so it blended and worked very seamlessly from very early on. Well, I tried to play a continental system with British players, and I couldn't agree with that at all. He's been very good. I'm glad he was left in the studio, because I worked with him once in commentary, uh, and I couldn't get a word in sideways. I think on Match of the Day, Alan created a genre whereby he was able to control the excerpts he used and make sense with what he said straight afterwards. I think he fitted into the demands of the programme better than anybody else I've seen. That second goal was a bit reminiscent of Dalgleish at his best. He runs a bit quicker than Kenny, didn't he, Sprite, mind you, but... <laughs> he and I were completely different when we were watching games. I watched it like a football punter, like the ball going from end to end. But I couldn't see why this team were running three nothing. But he could say, well, it's that midfield player has lost this, their midfield player, blah, 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 blah. blah. And he would see it all, and he could tell you why this team's three up. If we say it's a brilliant goal, Hanson says no defensive error. Why do you think you became such a good pundit? I worked with a lot of good people, and Lynham was just the best. I mean, I was fortunate to have him. I couldn't believe how nervous he was. Alan Hanson, this great star of football, won the league championship at untold times, came on the show nervous as a cat. Alan always had that brain that analyses things. Des is really relaxed and laid back. The conference is over. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. No. We're going to have some football, apparently. I think Des would have met him and thought, I can help this fellow. And the combination of the two then really worked. I just think he's playing with so much confidence, it's unbelievable. We were just only going to show the goals. That's you how it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. the goals. That, that I'd say to Desmond, you want to get away from that, I said, because you'll have replays of the goals. You want to try and do something different. This is classic centre-forward play. There's no way he should be able to get into the box from here. But with strength, determination and excess pace, he gets away from Bart Williams and he just drags his shot wide. Then we got a bit of recognition for what we were doing and never really looked back. It helps if you've been a top class player and you've won a bit. It helps if you're forthright, it helps if you can speak and it helps if you're going to speak your mind. Well, it, it looks like it'll be the goal of the season. Obviously, I'm going to find a flaw in it somewhere. <laughs> if Alan were to say after a game, Jamie Rennett played well, or look at this from Jamie Rennett, I was so happy. That made me feel a million dollars because it was a respect that you wanted as a footballer. It was an acknowledgement that you'd done well and, um, and it came from, from someone like Alan Hansen. It meant so much. You know, match today is such an important show and he always felt when Alan Hansen spoke that that was the final word, that that was the authority. And I grew up on him. He probably won't like me saying that, you know, but uh, you know, he, he did everything in the game and obviously he gets his points across quite well and when he speaks, people listen.
He had credibility when he finished his career and he was able to deliver it very well too. That Scottish accent always helps. The whole defending is like <laughs> the mother of all shockers. It's the worst defender I've ever seen in my life, bar none. There's certain ways of doing match of the day. I've always been unorthodox. And so I always wait till, till the final whistle and say, right, can you find the great words? Can you find? So the guys, they've got to go through the tapes and, and they'll say, when was it? And I'll say, well, it was between 15 minutes and 35, which usually means it's 49. And I slaughter them for not being able to find this stuff. Uh, but that's the way I've always done it. Can we see that at any stage? Can we get that up? I mean, centre-back players always be about being in contact, so if the ball goes off over oh, the first one's head, then the second one's there to, to mop up and vice versa. Is that why you and Laura are so look, close Look how close he's to me, it goes past me there. This is the closest it's... we ever were, I can tell you that much. If Carry it goes past me there, there's nowhere to... I used to get between yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in your dreams. Anyway, <laughs> Laura is, is a natural talker, so I think it was easier for him than for anybody else. Shouldn't, um, shouldn't I be there and you be Should here? be, but I'm, I was always covering for you anyway, so... Yeah, right. right. Yeah, that's right. And Falco's got it away from Lawrenson. And here's Crooks, covered by Alan Hansen. See, just like, nearly, just like when we played... Nearly bumped into him. Right, yeah. They say, what was your relationship like? I said, well, I just did whatever he told me to do. It's called delegation. Yeah. So because actually I when... said, as somebody said to me that you don't want to be heading it right long term, I said, Laura, you head it. And then somebody said to me, you don't want to be tackling. But yeah, Laura, you tackle. And then somebody said to me, you don't want to be running. I went, Laura, you run. <laughs> Very good at doing nothing. Right. And then take the accolades. Yeah. In the punting game, it's the same. You do all the work, and, but also I'll give you the crap games and I'll take yeah, the good oh, games. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fair enough. That, that is called delegation. I've had 17 years of crap games, don't worry about that. Do you remember that day we did FA Cup Live? That was, how, well, did we, how did we ever get away Well, that? ever forget that. That was one of the, the great broadcasts of all time. A little more homework than usual has been required by Alan Hansen and Mark Lawrenson. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Back to work. And after your homework, what have you concluded? <laughs> <laughs> after you, Al. <laughs> well, forget that. Let's talk about Morgan. <laughs> it was that bad a game that we decided to have a bit of a spoof where I'd ignore him, then yeah. you'd ignore him, then he'd come back to me, and then we'd talk. Remember they used to have that dressing room door that went straight onto the street? <laughs> Didn't ask any questions. No, nothing at all. But I never heard the 60 seconds to go, 30 seconds to go, or this is for real. Is this for real, isn't it? That's yeah, what he is, used to this say. This is for isn't it? real. It's obviously not for real, is it? <laughs> Are we on air? <laughs> yes, we're on air, Hans. Right, okay then. Tell the Tomo story. <laughs> the worst thing you can say. Are we on air? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm lying back like that, and I heard Armstrong in the scanner saying, "Two right, we're on air." And I sort of jumped up. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh God, how, yeah. did we, how did we get away with that?" Before I became a pundit, I didn't like any of them, I didn't like pundits. I always thought they never knew what they were talking about. Fowler was in the best Jimmy, position to... be quiet, will ya? And Jimmy, I'm thinking, I ain't gonna like him within five minutes. He was, in five minutes, I loved him. Also, Collymore could break through the Spurs' defence. <laughs> 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 You won't get it better than that <laughs> yeah, 109 times. <laughs> modern day ones? The modern day ones, Al has got all that criteria. Single minded, knows the game inside out, top class player. Is this an old man's tackle? Um, <laughs> That's just an old high, man trying high, to get back. It's late and it's vicious, but apart from that, it was perfectly fair. <laughs> I always say to him that I finished his career because I remember running past him at Anfield when I was a young whippersnapper at, uh, at Southampton. And um, I told him it was time to pack in when I ran past him because I wasn't the quickest. You get into it and find this is a bit harder than I thought it was, and then you become really good at it. And that's what Al's done, he's yeah. become really good at it. He'd probably just be nice, I don't know what he'll say behind closed doors to his mates. How can you complain when the ball ends up in the I'll, back I'll of the net? What it is. Jeez, well, you stick to defending, that is true on the track. <laughs> There's lots of good ones coming through. I mean, obviously, Gary Neville's done extremely well at Sky. I've always liked Jamie and worked with Jamie here. Yeah. I mean, you could never do that. You, you had the problem that all England players have got of coming inside, coming inside. Graham Sooner, I mean, you only say he's coming through, but he's excellent as well. So. There's a, there's a mixture. There's one famous line, well, many famous mm. lines um, that, that you've uttered over the years, but there's, there's one in particular that um, always stands out, of course. Uh, the opening day of the season, Manchester United, Aston Villa. Villa still have it. Here's Charles, just drilled it in. Taylor scores. Reaper. It's 2 0. And we played just over 35 minutes. It's in danger of becoming a real rout, and already it's a scoreline. Asks serious questions of Manchester United. I blame you for that because you were on that I night. Was and on you, that night, and yeah. you said to me when Man United had been beaten by Aston Villa, a very similar line. So you're going to blame me for it? No, you had this thing with Bob Paisley who said to me, "Experience was everything," and I thought, well, that's right, but I'll change it a bit. I never forget that moment. He 
he almost ruined my life that night watching Match of the Day. We'd just been beat at Aston Villa and I came home, watched it on the telly with my, with my mum and dad. And, and obviously he's such a well-respected pundit, when he says something, the, the country listens. United were scarcely recognisable from the team we've known over the last couple of seasons. What's going on, do you feel? I think they've, they've got problems. I wouldn't say they've got major problems. Obviously, three players have departed. The trick is always buy when you're strong. So he needs to buy players. You can't win anything with kids. When Sir Alex made that call to replace uh, Kanchelskis, Hughes and Ince with the kids, we all thought he'd lost the plot and all. You just... Thinking, will, will it go right? Yeah, you know, will it be okay? Um, you still obviously believe in your own ability as young players, but we were going into the unknown really as a group. Beckham's up on the right, Gig shoots, oh, well, that has settled it. It acted as kind of a motivational theme throughout the season, really, and from that day onwards, we improved and managed to prove him wrong. Manchester United win the FA Carling Premiership. I lied to those four or five kids. I don't know the five kids, and he will never win anything, and he's right. I was defending him on, on that comment, really because we didn't win the league with kids really. I mean, we had you know, Roy Keane, Pallister Bruce, Cantona, Schmeichel were the critical people in that team towards the end of the season when we needed carrying over the line. It was the experienced players that really helped us and delivered for us. Since then, obviously you see him and it's something that we always joke about now, but at the time, he was probably right in what he was saying. To this day, I stand by that line. Yeah. I mean, you, how many times in your life have you seen a manager pick experience before you? It happens all the time. The kids became superstars, but the superstars in that team were the Schmeichels and the Cantonas. You're still wriggling up the time. <laughs> it, was a, it was a line that made me. I, I mean, was going to say, do you think that line was good for you or bad for you? It was great for me. Yeah. I mean, it was fantastic. Everybody recognises the line. Yeah. You go to Houston, he'd throw and they'd be shouting for behind poles. Hey, not, I mean, and, like, and also try to do the accent. Yeah. Nobody can do that. I tried it once yeah, myself, yeah. I think. That is absolutely <laughs> diabolical yeah. defending. Terrible defending. <laughs> terrible it's defending. not as good as terrible. terrible. They're all useless at doing the accent. I've heard some people do you quite well. Oh, hello, pal. Defence is terrible. Go. It's like, well, you know. You cannot defend like that. You've got to play higher up the field. The, the lines were all over the place. Absolutely woeful. Absolutely shocking defending. <laughs> it gives him a wise, gives him a great goal. Great goal. <laughs> That's rubbish, actually, isn't it? There's so many of your sayings that I've heard so many times over the years. I've got lots of them. Your poise, passion, precision. <laughs> Effort, attitude and commitment is yeah. Kenny's. Time and time so again. Time and time again. Indecision is final is a good one I came up with. One yeah, I thought of that myself. Yeah. It's not a great combination. <laughs> it's that. not a great combination. And obviously the shocking, unbelievable, shocking, terrible diabolical. defending. When was the last time I said diabolical on television? I will bet Just you now. it's about six years ago. <laughs> also, the decision against them was diabolical. Never a penalty in a million years. The other thing people interested in, and I've looked at it for 20 years, the scar on the forehead. <laughs> Where's that from? I was playing volleyball. We were playing in a youth club in Bridge of Allen. I uh, missed the bus. I see a, an opening, I think it's a door. And they went through the glass window. The sun was shining, you just never saw it. He went right through it. I'm lying there. I don't know I've hit it. I don't know the blood's coming out like that. And I don't know you can die. First person I see is my brother, who says... Brina Brin. It's a fair well, comment. Yeah, well, three people had hit it that day. And I was the only person that had gone through it. We sued the sports centre and I went to the court case and Alan was with them the day before the court case because he's had his hair down. The day before it, he had his hair swept back. So the judge said, it doesn't seem to bother you too much this big scar because you've got your hair swept back. So he got a few bob, but he didn't get as much as he should have. Brain of Britain. Maybe not, but give him a break. The brain of punditry. For 22 years, the king of the pundits. So that's it for a match of the day. Definite decision? Absolutely. I mean, 22 years. Why now? Why? I just Still young? I, I think I've had a great time. I, you know, I went at, right at the very top at Liverpool. The last game I ever played was when we won the, the, the title in 1990. I think that I've had a great season in match of the day. I know I'm not going to miss it. And that is, you don't think you'll never, miss it? No. The minute I walked out the door at Liverpool, never missed it at all. And I know the minute I walk out this door, I'm not going to miss it. I think he's been a star on the show, don't you, down the years? He's a very nice man, good man. And uh, I'm sure all of us will wish him a, a happy retirement. You almost forget that he was a player with how good he was and how important he has been to, to television and to match of the day. Yeah, he'll be missed because he's very good at it. He's very good at his job, very well respected and rightly so. You can't have been in it for that amount of time if you're not good at it. He's an iconic figure at the BBC and he's, he's one that probably every pundit that's getting into the game aspires to be like. 22 years on an iconic programme with the best people working for